the guests on the Hack My Age podcast are just getting better and better and better. And it's going to be really hard to beat this next one. And it's a true pleasure and honor to host Dr. Sachidananda Panda, who's also known as Sachin Panda. And today we're going to talk about circadian rhythms and fasting and how this affects those living with diabetes. But what we discuss is relevant for just about anyone, whether or not you have diabetes. So you better listen closely because it just may change your life. Dr. Panda almost goes without introduction. So just about everyone who's heard the word fasting probably has learned about him and his work already. But just in case you haven't, Dr. Panda is a professor at the Salk Institute in California, where he's got a lab that does research of circadian rhythms. And if you don't know what a circadian rhythm is, don't worry, we're going to take a deep dive into this so you will never ever forget it. And Dr. Panda is at the forefront of research in four major areas that are really super relevant to healthy aging. And these can be summarized as nurturing the circadian clock, clocking the drugs and drugging the clock. And this offers a really new and unique approach to preventing, managing, and even reversing chronic diseases. And what I love about his approach that he's not only thinking about how to make a change on an individual level, but how to affect the world on a community level. And this is where things become revolutionary. So Dr. Panda has made a ton of discoveries in his lab that make him so famous. And the most groundbreaking ones are his discovery of a blue light sensor in the retina of the eye, which has led to human-centric lighting to optimize our sleep, our mood, and even our brain function. And then he discovered that eating within an eight to 12 hour window called time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting can prevent or reverse chronic disease and increase healthy lifespan. And the key word here is healthy lifespan. There's no point in having a really long lifespan if you're sick most of the time. And then he's also known for circadian genomic studies in primates, which identified the dosing of the majority of the FDA approved drugs that can be optimized to the right time of day to reduce the negative effects of the drugs and improve their efficacy. I mean, that's just insane <laughs> I can do this. And finally, his lab, along with several others, have, has discovered that drugs targeting circadian clock components are a multi-solving approach to treat chronic diseases like liver disease, cancer, and the dreaded Alzheimer's disease. And Dr. Wapanda will translate all of this into English we can all understand. And now before we start the interview, I'm going to read out the fancy disclaimer that the content of this interview should be treated as personal opinion and not medical advice. And the listeners should consult with their physicians for any lifestyle intervention as it may affect their existing condition and medication. So now, without further ado, I'm truly humbled and honored to introduce you to Dr. Panda. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. I'm happy to be here. Um, so, so pleased that you made time for us. And I, before we, we kind of dive into your research, I, I really would love for you to, to explain to the, to the world <laughs> of um, where how did you get here? Like what brought you into this world of circadian clocks and rhythms and fasting and diseases? Yeah, so when you think about uh, our health or our fitness, uh, what determines good health in the morning is not the same in the evening. So for example, in the morning, you want to be wired up, you want to be energetic and ready to do stuff. Whereas in the evening, you want to cool down and go to sleep. Similarly, in the middle of the night, you want to sleep. You don't want to wake up and eat. So the bottom line is that must be, I was curious about what is that code that determines and optimizes our health in every hour of the 24 hours day. And fortunately that time, almost 25 years ago, I stumbled across circadian rhythm, um, which essentially describes how our bodies states changes throughout 24 hours and at that time there was a lot of genetics going on so i thought well if i get into the field right now then hopefully we can figure out what are the genes and how they control physiology metabolism behavior and sleep every hour of the day 
so that we could understand what is the master uh, program that controls and regulates how fit we are in every hour of the day. So that's how I got into it. And uh, when you say fasting, I mean, we have to accept the fact that we have been told by nutritionists and our loved ones that we have to be eating in every one to two hours we are awake. And uh, that's not the case, because if we look at our circadian rhythm, or when you understand from our body's point of view, our body is actually programmed to go through at least 12 to 14 hours of uh, window without food. I don't call it fasting because you are not depriving the body that it needs. You are actually giving the body what it needs. So <laughs> I don't use that word fasting. So that's why in our studies, uh, we call this approach as time restricted eating. So this is one aspect of that circadian rhythm. And what we are finding is, uh, and you mentioned that light is a great cue that entrains or aligns our sleep-wake cycle or brain circadian rhythm to the day-night cycle. Uh, similarly, when we eat and when we fast, synchronizes our body's clock um, to also our eating fasting cycle. So in that way, uh, when you eat, uh, does actually much more than um, your metabolism, it synchronizes, it almost acts as the master conductor of our circadian rhythm in different organs. So that's how I kind of went from keep being curious about what are these 24 hours rhythms to now learning more about how the body reacts to a period of time without food. So interesting. Really, it's, it is groundbreaking. And I think we need to explain a little bit what circadian clocks are because we're going to talk about the master regulator clock and mm -hmm. circadian rhythms like why don't we have a brief explanation of what that actually means yeah so the word circadian literally means uh, near 24 hours rhythms so circadian rhythms are rhythms that uh, things in our body that repeats itself in every 24 hours and what we are learning now is almost every hormone, every neurotransmitter or brain chemical, every enzyme, and even every gene in our genome rises and falls at specific time of the day or night. And these are all we call circadian rhythms, enzyme function, hormone function, etc. And then um, diving deep into how these are regulated, scientists have discovered that just like our brain has a clock that tells us when to sleep or when to wake up every single cell in our body has its own clock so that means even our hair follicle has clock that tells our hair to grow at certain time and not to grow at another time similarly our digestive system has its own clock that tells when we should be eating so that we can digest and absorb nutrient much better our heart has a clock lungs has a clock so almost every organ has its own clock so we're just beginning to understand how those clocks regulate or optimize organ functions. Mm, so that's a great way to think about it is a, is a clock, a 24 hour uh, function. And in any case, anybody has doesn't know that you wrote the first book was called The Circadian Clock. And so you probably get a lot of information there, but your new book, The Circadian Diabetes Code, sorry, the first book was The Circadian Code, right? Did I say that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. And because I got clock and code mixed up. So, <laughs> so yeah, but now the circadian diabetes code is what we're talking about now today too. And it's very interesting how you say every single cell in our organs have a clock or organs have dip their own clocks. And this just reminds me in my master's of gerontology study, Dr. David Lee, I'm not sure if you know him as well. Yeah, yeah. He's finding out that the mitochondria has its own circadian rhythm. Is there, do you know about this research? It just kind of came to my yeah. head. I mean, uh, what you're finding is when we say every, every cell has its own clock, that means uh, the functions of the cells are also time to different time of the day. And mitochondria, which makes energy, which is the powerhouse of the cell, uh, it has its it it goes through 24 hours clock um, rhythm so that means at certain time of the day the mitochondria produce are competent to produce more energy and then at another time they repair themselves and get ready for next cycle of uh, um, energy production 
but all of these are regulated by in the last few years we the field has discovered many clock genes mm -hmm. uh, so there are 12 to 14 of these clock genes and these genes rise and fall at different time of the day and uh, these genes actually are almost like master regulator because each one of them can regulate thousands of genes within a cell and a great fraction of those genes are mitochondria genes uh, so that's how the clock genes their rise and fall uh, regulate when the mitochondria produce more energy when they should rest repair divide and then get back ready for another round of energy production Hmm. So then what you're saying is that the cell or the organelles inside the cell and the organ itself, they have their own individual clocks or do they work together as one clock? They, each cell um, uh, has one clock. We cannot say that mitochondria has its own clock, nucleus has its own clock, uh, not hmm. like that because the clock genes, what happens is uh, they spend some time in the, in, outside the nucleus and then when they get together they move inside the nucleus and do some work and then come back so by going back and forth between outside and inside the nucleus um, they regulate a subset of genes outside the nucleus for example the mitochondria and then when they go back to the uh, nucleus and turn on transcription turn on gene expression turn on many other genes then they indirectly also affect many cellular functions so there is only one so far, we have seen that there is only one master clock, because if you disrupt that master clock, then we also dis see disruption of the mitochondria rhythms. Mm. So that's proof that there's only one clock. This makes me wonder then, I've, I, you hear people who are in more holistic uh, nutritionists or holistic, take a holistic approach to health. They talk very often about a, sort of, the, they have a picture of a clock and then they say the, the liver is, being repaired or has its function at 2 a.m. and then the kidney has it at this you know certain time and is there any truth to that? Well I can go back and uh, comment on what the holistic physicians say mm -hmm. um, because I don't know how they came to a conclusion but what we know from modern science is um, it's not that exactly at two o'clock some repair process starts uh, that's absolutely wrong. <laughs> it means there is a wave of repair process that can happen and it's tied to individual sleep wake cycles. So for example, if someone is going to sleep at 8 p.m. versus someone who's going to sleep at midnight, they will have slightly different time when the organs can repair themselves. Um, so there is no absolute um, strict timing that when the bell rings two o'clock then a liver just wakes up and repairs itself. Mm -hmm. um, but what we are finding is um, we simplify and say this is repair, but that's actually much more to it. Um, uh, there are many processes in the liver where the fat gets burnt or uh, the mitochondria divide um, or many essential nutrients are made. And so all of these contribute to some kind of repair process and there is a wave to it and that wave is linked to how many hours we passed mm -hmm. uh, it's almost linked to when is our last meal and then from there the countdown begins yeah so this is definitely yeah this is where the fasting comes in and let's talk a little bit about the scn the suprachiasmatic nucleus because this is what you in your book have mentioned as the master regulator clock and you said that the the this SCN resets the liver clock. So what does that really mean? And what does that do for us by sort of resetting certain organs? Yeah, so uh, you can imagine, um, so SCN is suprachiasmatic nucleus. Uh, that means it's, it's the group of cells that are present above the optic chiasma. Uh, what it means is, as you and many people know, we have two eyes and those two eyes send information into the brain and our left eye sends information to the right brain and right eye sends to left brain. So the information uh, goes through what we call optic nerve. These are bundles of cables you can imagine and the crisscross at the base of our brain, that's the hypothalamus. 
And the suprachiasmatic nucleus, this group of nearly 20,000 neurons, only 20,000 neurons out of billions of neurons in our brain, um, they sit right above the optic chiasm. And why they're called master regulator is you can take in experimental animals, you can take chunk of brains in, 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 from many parts, but the mice or rats will still go to sleep and wake up in every 24 hours. But if someone takes out these 20,000 neurons surgically, then the mice or rats will lose their 24 hour rhythms of activity, sleep, feeding, body temperature, drinking, hormones, all these rhythms fall apart. But at the same time, if we look at individual cells from these animals, then those individual cells still have clocks. So they're not just not talking to each other. So that's why we call the suprachiasmatic nucleus as the master clock. It's almost like the conductor, master conductor. If you don't have a master conductor in orchestra, each orchestra player may be playing their music instrument, but then may not be synchronized. They will not lead to an orchestra, <laughs> it will lead to something else. So similarly, uh, SCN acts like the master conductor. Mm -hmm. And there are many different ways it communicates and synchronizes the other clocks. Uh, one idea is the SCN sends some neurochemicals um, that directly or indirectly travels to other parts of the body, including the liver, lungs, heart, etc., and then tells them this is the time, uh, this is like the time outside and be ready uh, to do your task. So that's how the SCN works. Got it. So this is very interesting in your research. You've explained it really well in the book. and. I would like to explain then, so what happens when the master regulator clock, the SCN, is disrupted? How does it get disrupted and then how do we fix it? What happens? So the SCN is, uh, how does the SCN take its timing cue? As you can imagine, since it sits right above the optic chiasma, uh, which get light information from the retina and the light information mostly comes from day and night cycle, uh, there are specialized cell type of cells in the retina uh, the sense blue light and daylight is the richest source of blue light. So they sense that light and then send the information to the SCN. The SCN knows that this is morning when the brightness level goes up. And that's how the SCN is connected to the or synchronized to the outside world. So now the question is, how does the SCN clock get disrupted? So when we live under continuous light. So for example, someone wakes up at three o'clock in the morning, turns on the light and has to do some work. And um, then during the daytime, for example, the person is sleeping for six, seven hours. So the SCN thinks that it's uh, gets confused whether it's night or not. And then in the evening again, the person wakes up, um, does some work or has sleep disrupted or has to wake up to care for somebody um, then the SCN gets confused and doesn't know when is morning, when is evening. So um, that's how the SCN clock gets disrupted. Uh, similarly, people who spend most of their time indoor, they don't get enough daylight. You don't have to be under sunlight. You know, even if it's cloudy outside, being outside gives enough light to synchronize our SCN clock. But in modern days, we spend more than 90% of our time indoor. And many of us, particularly in winter time, we close our windows and curtains and we are kind of in a dark room, a relatively dark room, because our SCN needs at least 10,000 to 5,000 lux of light. And uh, for example, if you are sitting next to a window, in a, even in a cloudy day, you get a thousand lux of light. Next to a window means within three feet of a window. And if you're outside in a cloudy day, you get five to 10,000 lux of light. And if you're outside in a sunny day, you can get 100,000 lux of light. But what we're finding from hundreds of people monitored over hundreds of days, that many modern we humans, we spend very little time outdoor or very little time exposed to even light uh, next to a window. So as a result, our SCN also gets confused. It thinks that we are living in a twilight zone. So that's how um, there is some disruption. The biggest disruption is shift work like lifestyle. People who do night shift work or morning shift work where they have to wake up very early and then in the weekend, they're trying to catch up with social life. So they change their lifestyle. 
or even young moms, uh, mothers who just had a baby and have to wake up three, four times a night, or older individuals, uh, grandparents who are caring for somebody else, whether they're spouses or their grandchildren, they're waking up three, four times, two, three times a night. So they also live the life of a shift worker. So their circadian rhythm is also disrupted because the retina and the SCN uh, get a lot of light information at the wrong time. So that's how I would say that almost all of us spend some months or years of our lives with the disrupted circadian rhythm. Yeah, thanks to the modern light bulb and our computers and our, our yeah, everything is, is disrupting everything. And so this is this is where it, they're interesting in your book, you, you've been able to explain how this is affecting people with diabetes or pre-diabetes or putting them at risk. And it um, does make me wonder, though, about people in, in the northern countries, say Finland and Sweden, where they have major shifts in the in daylight in, in the summer, it's uh, almost 24 hours. And, and then they, in, the, in the wintertime, they have very, very little light, like what, how their CSCN must be completely off. And what do they do about this? Yeah, so actually, if you look at a human um, the history of human civilization, we humans stayed within 20 degree north and south of the equator for most of the history. And only in the last uh, three to 4,000 years ago, people moved away from the equator. And only when we had access to a lot of fire and heating, then we actually lived comfortably in northern and very extreme southern latitudes. Uh, so as a result, we are not actually designed to live under such very long days and very short days. And uh, there is epidemiological data showing that as we move away from the equator, then the suicide rate actually goes up. And again, in the northern latitude, suicide rate also uh, depression goes up in winter months. That's why the term winter blues. And then when people go from winter to summer, around springtime, again, the suicide rate spikes. So there is a huge mental health burden for living in these northern latitudes. As a result, uh, people in this, in this extreme latitudes, they understand the value of light. Uh, so for example, if you go to many of these countries, you'll see uh, salon that are uh, just lights up. People go there just to spend an hour or two on the bright light because they know that the light is antidepressant. It's plentiful um, during summer, but in winter, it's so rare that you have to pay to get into a room to get bright light. Uh, so people have really adapted uh, in many different ways to lessen the burden of depression in winter and lessen the burden of uh, suicide or extreme swing in mood during springtime. So they have maybe a higher risk of, of uh, suicide rates, but uh, or higher risk of suicide, or higher suicide rates in general. But do they have are they more at risk of diseases? Well, so they have other diseases. I Means uh, we just can't, uh, you know, you started it with metabolic disease or diabetes. Um, you know, uh, diabetes is also a function of many other factors. The quality and quantity of food also play into this. And if you look at in Europe, Northern Latitude, those countries are also very concerned about their food quality. And since they cannot grow a lot of food, um, they import a lot of food. So they are paying a big price for the food. So they're very careful about what they choose, what they eat. Uh, so maybe that's helping them to lessen the burden of disease. But at the same time, if we look at last 20 years of trend, the diabetes trend, diabetes and obesity are also trending up in those countries, although not as steeply as we see in the US. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And they, they do have, I used to live in Moscow, so and I, in the summertime, we'd have three hours of darkness and having little kids there telling them to go to sleep at eight was almost impossible. So everyone has these big blackout curtains and hacks and ways to, to get to overcome that because we do need to, to sleep. And eventually you do, you just adjust, yeah. but very interesting. So sleep is a pretty big, important thing to have when you're trying to have optimized uh, like your circadian rhythms. And you mentioned that, I think it was seven to eight hours of sleep is, is optimal. Is that correct? 
Yeah, so there are epidemiological studies on millions of people looking at how many hours people sleep and what are the diseases they have or how long they live even. And what they found is there is a use set curve. So that means people who live less than five and sorry, less than six hours, they have shorter lifespan and are more likely to have more diseases. And also people who sleep more than eight to nine hours, they also had more diseases and had slightly shorter lifespan. So that's why the sweet spot for adults is somewhere between six and a half to seven and a half hour or maximum eight hours of sleep. A maximum of eight. Yeah, I mean, it, it's also personal, you know, uh, some people, we're talking about population and there is always a spread. So uh, you got to listen to your body. Uh, but the bottom line is for most people, if, if we target to be in bed for eight hours, then at least we can get seven to eight hours of sleep. Mm, okay, so it's, yeah, the actual number of sleep is between seven and eight, not uh, as long as you're yeah. in bed around, around eight hours, maybe <laughs> nine, because it takes you a lot longer yeah. to, to fall asleep. Yeah. And so yeah. this is affecting uh, the way people, you know, the amount of sleep and, I'm, and, and the quality of sleep. And in your book, you've given such great detail as well of how to do this. So for example, getting outside in the morning, getting your daylight, having that sunlight hit the retina, and that adjusts uh, your you know, circadian clock. And I learned from a sleep scientist, and I don't know again if this is how true this is, but we were talking about blue blocking glasses, which um, you know is fantastic if you're gonna be on a computer or you're gonna be under, under the light uh, when the sun goes down. But she mentioned there was a compounding effect and of um, if you outside several hours of the day, it's like maybe one hour in the morning and then go walk the dog in the afternoon, that you may not need these blue blocking glasses. And I can't remember her research of what she did, but I don't know if you have any, any research on that. No, I haven't heard anything like that. That uh, if you, And uh, another thing is the blue blocking glasses. There is also not much research on their efficacy mm. on sleep because they come in many different uh, varieties. We don't know how much blue light they block. And uh, the most important thing is you don't need all this stuff. If you, what you have at your disposal is the light switch. <laughs> you dim down your light. You don't need to wear those blue blocking glasses and walk around. Of course, there are some use, like for example, those of you who are going to the grocery store or um, drugstore at night, those stores have super bright light. Yeah. And that bright light can disrupt our sleep because that bright light, the new bright LEDs in most stores, they are also a very rich source of blue light. So they reduce our melatonin level and will not let us easily fall asleep. So in those cases, maybe blue blocking glasses may be useful, but at the same time, since there is no strict regulation of blue blocking glasses, um, these days we see anything from 2% blocking to 80% blocking and, you know, a glass may block five to 10% of blue light, but it may not have any physiological effect. So let's not go there because when there is no regulation, then we can't talk too much about how much of blue blocking glasses will help. The bottom line is if the glasses look funky, red or orange color, then they're more likely to be reducing a significant amount of blue light. And those who have difficulty falling asleep, maybe for them, after dinner, if you wear them, uh, and I have seen it among many of our um, friends, relatives, and also patients that if they wear those funky red or uh, orange color glasses, then it helps them to easily fall asleep because mm -hmm. it might increase the production of melatonin. Mm -hmm. You have to try it and see if it works. That's all. <laughs> Do your end of one experiment. And in the same, I guess the same is for the night shift on our phones or computers. We same thing where we're not really sure of the effects. Well, the thing is, a uh, night shift is a you know just like for waking up, you know, the alarm clock or the um, or your lights will brighten up, and then that signals you to wake up. So similarly, if there is a signal that can nudge you to prepare for sleep, then it's good to have that night shift feature. So since we're always looking at phones and tablets and laptops, if we see the screen color is changing or dimming down, then we, that's a signal 
that we should be winding down to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. So for example, alarm clock will not wake you up. It signals you to wake up. You have the freedom to press the snooze button and go back to sleep. <laughs> Similarly, the, the night shift feature is a nudge. Uh, it's not going to make you fall asleep unless you really go and <laughs> lie down on the bed, close your eyes, and then turn off all the lights. Yeah, it's like your mom nudging you. Go to bed. Uh, so you try to take that more seriously. So let's talk about diabetes because this is what your book is all about, the circadian diabetes code. And as a gerontologist, I'm I'm really concerned because as you mentioned, one in three people in the US or one in four globally have either have diabetes, elevated blood glucose, or is at risk. And many of these people are in low and middle income countries. And what many people don't even know you know, they may even be pre-diabetic because people not, they're not testing themselves. And the CDC has even said that diabetes was the seventh leading cause of death. I think now because of COVID, it's, it's the eighth, but it's definitely on the rise. And in your book, you've mentioned how sleep and exercise and fasting can help with this. So maybe, maybe we should start about with the fasting because um, how, how is how, let's explain a little bit more how fasting can help someone lower their diabetes risk or even reverse it. Yeah, so let's begin with the some um, clarification. Diabetes is not the eighth cause of the death. It may be actually second or third because heart disease kills people. That's the number one cause. And many heart disease patients actually have underlying diabetes. And diabetes is the first step for many people to get into heart disease. Uh, similarly, diabetes also exacerbates several conditions of cancer and obesity and diabetes are risk factor for cancer and cancer is the second cause of the um, death. And for even Alzheimer's. Yeah, yeah. I, I was surprised 80% of people who have Alzheimer's have diabetes, like that's a number that blew my mind. Yeah, and then similarly COVID-19 patients who succumb to their um, disease, uh, many of them, the underlying people say they had underlying condition and sometimes the underlying condition is diabetes or heart disease. So diabetes is the gateway, it's the, it's the gate that opens to <laughs> go through that sliding, uh, sliding path to many other diseases. So now fasting, uh, although you use the word fasting, I just say that it's not fasting because you are depriving your body of nutrition that it needs. You are actually offering the body the escape from excessive nutrition that you are flooding it with. Um, it's almost like if you want to grow um, a plant, we know that the plant needs water, but you cannot put your rose pot uh, somewhere in your sink and expect it to grow. And that's exactly what we are doing by feeding ourselves all the time food. We are submerging our rose plant <laughs> pot in the sink and then expecting that this is going to grow. So, yeah. so fasting, so let's think about what happens. Uh, diabetes is when we produce more insulin uh, and that insulin is ineffective in letting tissues absorb and metabolize appropriately the glucose. And insulin goes up only when we eat and when we eat something that has carbohydrate, since most of our food, particularly food that we eat from plants sources, um, have at least 50 to 70% carbohydrate. That means everything that we eat will likely trigger release of insulin. And um, we cannot expect to eat only meat and other stuff all the time. So. Uh, and it takes only one to two grams of carbohydrate to trigger our pancreas to produce that insulin. And that one to two grams can be one third teaspoon of sugar that you may be putting into your coffee or tea. So that's as a tiny amount of food that actually triggers insulin release. So in a way, if we, if we deprive, if we rest or give our body rest from food for 12 to 14 hours, then we are essentially telling our pancreas not to produce insulin during those 12 to 14 hours. And our cells in our body will get primed to insulin function so that when we eat, even with a little bit of insulin, our body, our muscles and liver and 
fat cells, all of them will be ready to absorb that glucose um, quickly, so our blood glucose will not rise. So that's one way that fasting, uh, um, staying away from food for 12 to 14 hours will help uh, reduce the insulin production, excessive insulin production, prime our cells to be more sensitive to insulin when we eat. And that's a very simple, straightforward approach. And then as we are learning more and more, we are also seeing that uh, during this fasting period, uh, the pancreas repairs itself so that it, uh, it is more prime, more fit to produce insulin. Our cells prime themselves for insulin function. Um, and also our gut, our, our immune systems, they also get prepared so that they don't um, lead to excessive inflammation due to leaky gut. Uh, so there are many other indirect benefits of um, giving yourself rest from food. Yeah, so it, it's not only just for the diabetes, it's just in general, it's a whole systems approach where the whole body can just take a moment to, to repair yeah. itself. And, and like you said, prime and be more sensitive. It, it just makes perfect sense. And in, in the book, you give great detail on how this I encourage everyone to, to get the book and, and take a deeper dive because we just don't have the time mm -hmm. for all of this. Yeah. But I, I appreciate how yeah, the time restricted feeding, which, you know, we'll call that, you know, within the fasting, because fasting just sounds so depriving, like, you know, uh, so, so it's just keeping it in a certain window. And you mentioned, uh, you know, there's, there is the great flexibility with this, but starting with the 12 hour fast, I think was the most approachable and easy for people to get started. And then you work up to what works best for you. And I'm wondering though, what, uh, is there any, in your studies, have you found any differences between men and women in terms of time-restricted feeding? Is there different approaches? Do they react the same, whether they have diabetes yeah. or not? Yeah, so these are in, important questions that we're asking right now. Um, to begin, uh, to go back when you said 12 hours, the reason why 12 hours is a good spot is um, if you just take a moment and just think one of the earliest time you have eaten in the last two weeks uh, that earliest time we're not asking what is the typical time when you eat <laughs> earliest time when you ate or consumed any food that had even half a teaspoon of sugar or even a little bit of cream then that might be 6 a.m and when is the latest time the last time you had food in your system and in the last two weeks and that may be at 9 p.m so there you can see that many of us actually in a study what we found is nearly 50 percent of adults in the u.s uh, have that time window the earliest and latest around 15 hours or longer so that means if you have 15 hours then coming down to 12 hours <laughs> is a big deal and then uh, if you can come down to I think you said 10%, not even 10% or doing Not even 10% hours. It within 12 hours. And then if you can come down to 10 hours, then that's a pretty good um, place to be in. Um, then the question is, are there differences between male and female? Um, of course, we can do much more controlled studies in laboratory animals, and many of our laboratory animals replicate very well in humans, and not the same magnitude. For example, mice can lose 20% body weight in the time that you're eating, but we humans, we don't lose that much, uh, 5 to 10% max. So what we're finding in animal studies is um, when female mice are put on time restricted feeding, that is nine to 10 hours of food access um, for seven days a week. Sometimes we have done it for five days a week and it still works pretty well. Then both male and female mice are protected from diabetes and high insulin. Um, they're also protected from liver disease. Uh, and this is very important because women are actually more resistant to liver disease um, but once women get liver disease uh, fatty liver disease then they get more severe form of fatty liver disease and it also progresses much faster to a non-alcoholic steatos hepatitis and liver cancer um, all those things happen much quicker in uh, women and what we're finding in mice is time restricted feeding equally protects both male and female mice against liver disease. We also found uh, there are many other benefits. So, for example, 
the female mice are much better protected against infection because um, the time restricted fed mice at the end of 12 weeks of time restricted feeding, we challenge these mice with uh, LPS, which is a bacterial um, protein that uh, bacterial component that triggers inflammation and can cause death. And what we found was time restricted fed females were completely protected only um, only five to 10% of mice died because of LPS challenge, whereas the male mice, usually if they eat ad libitum, nearly 80% die. And if they are eating time restricted, then 50% die. So mm. compared to <laughs> males, females are much better protected against inflammation and inflammatory disease under time restricted feeding. The one thing that uh, we did not find, <laughs> which might uh, make many people a little sad, was uh, time restricted feeding did not prevent uh, the female mice to from gaining slight uh, body weight gain. So, but there is a caveat: the mice, female mice, are always much lighter in weight than male mice, and they actually don't get as fat as male mice, but they do get a little bit of uh, body mass, and what we found was the even though they did not reduce their body weight, the fat was much better than the ad libitum fed mouse because in these days we know that there are two different types of fat, the brown fat and white fat. White fat is the one that's bad um, because brown fat has more mitochondria. What we found was time restricted feeding increased mitochondria content in fat cells and also uh, in the female mice, time-restricted feeding completely removed all the inflammatory cells in fat because mm -hmm. we know that the fat, partly it is bad because a lot of inflammation in fat and time-restricted feeding kind of reduced that. So the bottom line is animal experiments are telling us that when animals are put on time-restricted feeding, then they're protected. Both male and females are protected from many, many different kinds of disease. The female mice may not be protected as much as the male mice are from weight gain, but female mice get the bonus of having healthy fat, more mitochondria, and are well protected against inflammatory disease. Hmm. And that's what matters, means at the end of the day, um, it doesn't matter whether you are slightly, uh, you wish to lose some weight or not, if you're healthy and if you're protected against many inflammatory disease, that's what will improve the quality of our lifespan and our performance. Absolutely. This is amazing, this, this, this research. I highly encourage people to read the book because you actually explain, we won't have time to go in now, how to do this, and how to practice time-restricted eating and how, what are the roadblocks and how to overcome them. And I want to open the panel in, in, and before we do, for people to ask their own questions, just want to talk a little bit about this My Circadian Clock app. I think this is a really ingenious app where we can uh, log in our own food and, and we can track things. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so this is uh, not a commercial app. So that means this is an academic app. People have to give us informed consent that uh, you're part of kind of a study <laughs> because you share data. We de-identify all information. So uh, when we publish or when we analyze, there is no uh, identifying information. Um, and what people can do is they can download the app for the first 12 to 14 days, You we want to gather what, what is your current lifestyle when you go to sleep when you wake up and when you are eating what you're eating and then after 12 to 14 days um, particularly those who have pre-diabetes or diabetes when they download the app they can mention that they are interested in diabetes then from the end of um, two weeks they will start getting some information about how circadian rhythm can help them with their diabetes management and can guide them through their journey to get to 12 hours of time restricted feeding and then maybe 10 hours of time restricted eating. It also gives you more information about what to eat um, because you can boost the power of time restricted eating with a little bit better food. Um, it tells a little bit about how what is carbohydrate, what is complex carb, what is good carb, what is bad carb because mm -hmm. since we are always uh, swimming in car, but better to know about what is good and bad. And 
to be frank, even I did not know a lot of information myself, only after I got into research and last four to five years, particularly, I'm learning a lot more. So uh, <laughs> I think that it's time that we should also let everybody share this insight and knowledge that our research team is learning. Oh, I love it. Yeah, no, I've been, it's super easy. You guys just download my circadian clock on your, on your app and, and you have like the, the button where you can just take a picture of your food. You don't have to do all this work and kind of yeah. has it done for you. So you make it very easy. I want to ask anyone here have any questions um, before Dr. Panda has to leave. I know, Leslie, I know you've got something and you've got something to, you have to go somewhere. So maybe you want to unmute and ask. Yeah, there's already a question in the chat. Let's see. What time uh, we're exposed to daylight? Oh, is it um, what is it important when you are actually exposed to daylight in the morning at noon, at the afternoon? Many people are working during a day and can catch the sunlight only in the afternoon. That, that was nice, Lena. Sorry about that. I just want to read for people who are listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, the best is if you can catch some daylight in the morning. So, for example, if you're driving to work, then you may um, you are actually getting a lot of light in your car because <laughs> even inside the car in this uh, cloudy day you are still getting thousand to two thousand three thousand lux of light and if you're if the sun is not in the horizon then there is no need to put really dark sunglasses and you can get enough light. The best is uh, as you said the best is to combine it with something else. So afternoon exercise is pretty good. So if you are have time to go for a brisk walk for 30 minutes in the afternoon when there is still some daylight or right after sunset, then that 30 minutes of walk with light will give you two for one. <laughs> Excellent. So two for one, that's what we like, these quick, quick hacks. Leslie. Uh, yes, hello. I wanted to ask a question regarding mental health. And since you have already shown that resetting the circadian clock can reverse diabetes, uh, I'm wondering about reversal of mental health issues. I live in the United Kingdom and 25% of citizens have some kind of mental health issue. Is it possible to reset someone's circadian rhythm in an environment, the Northern hemisphere, like we have in the UK? Can you reset their circadian rhythm just using food and somehow help beat some of the depression that way? <laughs> Yeah, so that's a great uh, question. And actually, in my first book, Circadian Code, I went into this. There was a story of a person who was working as a milk delivery person all his life, and then he retired. And then after retirement, he got into depression. And then they realized that, okay, so this guy was waking up in the morning, he was exposed to daylight in the morning half. And after retirement, he was just stuck indoor for the <laughs> most of the day. So when he went back again outside, outdoor for a few 45 minutes to an hour, then many of his mental health issues reversed. So now coming back to fixing the circadian cord. And so there are two aspects that contributes to mental health from circadian rhythm point of view. One is disrupted sleep will definitely affect mental health. And second is deprivation of bright light, daylight. And uh, particularly in cold country, people consider going outside to prevent cold is a good thing, but going, <laughs> by not going outside, you also deprive yourself of daylight. So there are a few things one can do. One is, um, you know, now the LED lights have become so cheap. One can actually have bright LEDs, but at the same time, put them on a timer so that you don't have those bright blue LEDs after sunset, after evening. Um, second is uh, just try to have breakfast next to a large window means that's the best way or lunch. Um, put your dining table next to a window, remove the curtain and then let light come in because we know that many people who have mental health issues, they may not actually venture outside the house. And many of them may be older adults who may need help to go outside, but at least we can bring daylight into the house by having the dining table next to the uh, window. And then for sleep, what we're finding is time-restricted eating, uh, this intermittent fasting actually helps people to sleep better and deeper. And when they sleep better, then they feel more energetic and alert in the morning. 
So by combining this daylight, getting an hour of daylight and eating within 10 hours, I hope that we can lessen the burden of many mental health issues. Thank you. Thank you for that. Excellent. Any other questions? Well, I've got a ton. Still have another one, Nelsley? Okay. <laughs> sure. Too, but I don't want to hog the, uh, the time. Um, well, there's a uh, an interesting, there, I know there are a few molecules that will help with resetting the circadian clock. And one of them uh, called spermidine, I'm very interested in. And I just wondered if you had looked at spermidine or friscolin or some of the other molecules that appear to reset the circadian clock. I don't know, there are many uh, chemicals that have been shown to reset the clock in a disc, in a fibroblast or even in animals. Um, the challenge is always um, getting the actual dose in the right time to humans and getting that absorbed. So in that sense, um, there is not much research done along that line. Um, the only thing, you know, from circadian rhythm point of view, melatonin and its variants have been uh, the ones that have been widely used and the impact of other ones have not been widely studied. And would you say that if we supplement with melatonin before bed, is it true that we actually downregulate our body's own production of it? Or for someone like me, I'm almost, I'm gonna be, you know, I'm, I'll, I'm heading towards 60. It, I have such low production anyway, I should supplement. What's your verdict? <laughs> well, it's true that, uh, uh, you know, a 50 year old would produce only 10% of the melatonin that the five year old produces. Um, that's without any supplementation or anything. So that means, yes, there is a um, there is a lot of uh, latitude to supplement. And there are, particularly, there are studies now showing that women who take melatonin supplementation are less likely to have breast cancer. So they reduce the breast cancer risk. So in that way, it may be a good idea to supplement, but at the same time, since melatonin inhibits pancreas function, so it's better to take that melatonin pill at least a couple of hours after dinner. So that means your dinner time should be three to four hours before bedtime. Yeah. So that way you can kind of time your dinner after two hours, melatonin, preferably slow release, then you can fall asleep. And that's fantastic. And I've heard that you can go up to a hundred, um, a hundred milligrams. That seems very high. That's very high. <laughs> that's very high. I mean, I'm sort of at the one milligram level, but I have heard other people say they do that. Yeah. So I guess uh, when it comes to melatonin, everybody should titrate themselves because as you said, some people are sensitive to even half a milligram. So, um, try that. Mm. Interesting. So I know you have to go. Uh, do you have time for one last question? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Karen's asked that she loves your work. It sounds very interesting and she looks forward to looking into it more. I, she says she also wants to get your opinion and thought on congenital hyperinsulinism. <laughs> hyperinsulinism. Yeah, so that's, um, that's very interesting, but I'm sorry. I don't have much information on that. I should know that and I'm sorry, I don't know. Is that a metabolic? Is that a metabolic disorder? It's a genetic disorder. It's a genetic disorder that um, yeah, there's two. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm. Children. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll look more into it. <laughs> I'll find someone for you, Karen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'm going to let you go because I know you have a very important call after this. And I really appreciate you coming on, spending time with us, explaining to women over 50 who are more sensitive, you know, more, sorry, more insulin resistant as we get older. And I think these are very important words for, for them. If anybody's interested, please, well, you've got to be interested by now. The Circadian <laughs> Diabetes Code, you can get this on Amazon and download the app. It's free, it's fun, and it holds you accountable for a lot of things. It's called My Circadian Clock in the app. Also, check out Circad The Circadian Code, the original book. I think it's awesome. And if you have questions, if you need to reach out to Dr. Panda, you can find him on Twitter at Sachin, S-A-T-C-H-I-N dot Panda. Any final words before I let you go? Anything you'd like to share with our women over 50? Well, so the thing is, um, there are a few things one can do. One is try to go to bed at a consistent time 
be in bed for eight hours. And then after waking up, wait for an hour or two before your first meal, because that's when your hormones are changing, day hormones are rising, night hormones are decreasing. Then after your first bite, count eight, 10, 11, or maximum 12 hours. If you can do 10 hours of eating for five days a week, that's great. And then your last meal should be three to four hours before your bedtime. And don't forget to step outside for at least 30 minutes to get some daylight and combine that with 30 minutes of brisk walking. So that's the key to <laughs> long, healthy lifespan. And awesome. a perfect circadian day. <laughs> I love it. It's so simple. Why don't we all do it, right? <laughs> Wonderful. And, and if you have trouble, really, the book is so great because it does walk you step by step and gives you so many great ideas on how to, how to do this. So thank you very much, Dr. Panda. I hope we can have you again as a part two because I only went through like Two yeah, questions. <laughs> yeah. Thank so much you. More. Take care. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, Thank you. you too. Bye bye. Bye bye.